welcome our next speaker, Nat Dudley. <laughs> Uh, so kia ora. I'm Nat. I'm Head of Design for Figure NZ. Um, if you don't know who we are, which most people don't, um, we're a charity and our mission is to help New Zealand become a data literate democracy, where everybody can use numbers in their thinking regardless of their abilities. So it's probably not much of a surprise that I think data visualisation is quite important. So Rhys talked this morning, awesome. So data visualisation is about communicating the stories held in numbers and helping people know what questions to ask. So why would most of you want to do data visualization? So you can do it to do fun stuff where you play around like um, a lot of stuff Ree was showing, but most of you all as front-end developers will have published data tables in some shape or form in things that you make, especially if you're doing any form of reporting. So like, what on earth does this actually tell you? Um, so it turns out that transforming the form enables you to see what's going on really quickly, makes it more user-friendly. We all like user-friendly things. So in this one, you can see that Auckland and Wellington have a median age that's much younger than, say, Marlborough. And same data transformed into map forms. It's a chloroplith map. Um, Oriental Bay, much higher median age than, say, Tiaro. So DataViz is awesome, makes people happy. We like that. Um, and it helps to communicate the meaning in the data. But DataViz that doesn't include everybody not really so awesome. So there's heaps and heaps and heaps of stuff that might mean that we can't read a data visualization. Um, so some of that's to do with background and ability, um, and some of it, unfortunately, is caused by how we design and build data visualization. So I'm talking about accessibility, everyone's love-hate relationship that they have when they code stuff. So we want data viz that is in our apps and in our sites and in our news and all of those places to communicate information in a more clear way. And so if we want that, we should probably try and deliver on that for everybody rather than just people who, I don't know, are a bit more privileged. So excluding people from participating because of our design decisions or our development decisions for that matter is both unfair and it's also really bad business um, because less people included is less people who can pay you money for the thing that you are building. People like making money, generally. So the key thing for accessibility, right, is that the insight should be communicated to everybody regardless of their abilities. This is not really a complicated concept to wrap your head around. But we mess this up in so many ways, so many. Um, so we don't put alt text on visualizations. It's very rare to see it. Um, we don't make data keyboard navigable. We don't provide an alternate way to actually read the data. So we're like, awesome, tables suck, let's get rid of tables. Except that some people need the tables to read the data. Not quite so great. So I'm going to contradict um, Rhea a little bit this morning, because something that you do need to think about is that the more complicated the visualization that you make, um, the more likely it is to exclude people who have um, diminished cognitive ability, who have lower education levels, all of those things. Um, as someone who works for a, basically a data viz shop, I love fancy data visualizations, but the user testing that we've done around it shows that most people who we want to communicate with, um, and that's particularly people from disadvantaged backgrounds, they're both intimidated by them and they can't read them. Now, that's not to say you shouldn't do them, just if you do do them, work with an experienced user experience designer who can help you to make sure that what you want to say is going to get across. So most of us suck at most of these things, but we've only got 30 minutes, so I can't unpack all of the suck. Um, so let's just talk about colorblindness, right? So this is what a lot of folks think about when you talk about colorblindness. This is what's called an Ishihara plate test. Um, we probably all did this as kids if you grew up in New Zealand. It's part of the mandatory screening. So what this measures is color vision deficiency, right? So despite the name, most color blindness isn't actually the complete inability to see color. So the test checks for your diminished ability to perceive differences between colors. Um, now, color blindness is almost always inherited. You can injure your eyes and cause it that way, chemical or physical, but almost always inherited. Um, it's a sex-linked inheritance, so it's linked to the X chromosome. Um, so this means it's more common in people who are XY carriers than people who are XX carriers. And there is a whole bunch of forms of color blindness, not just the red-green that you might have heard of. So, um, what's behind this, right? So if you know a little bit about eyes, this might be familiar. So eyes use rods and cones. Rods sense movement and brightness. 
cones sense colour. So they respond to short, medium and long wavelengths of light, which correspond to blue, green and red. If you can see how close the green and red ones are, you might understand why we start to have a bit of a problem. So there are eight different types of colour blindness that people experience, right? And you want to try and solve for all of these when you build colour uh, data visualisation. So anomalous trichromats, right, they have reduced sensitivity in one of the types of cones. So this is the most common one, and it means that most people don't have complete loss of colour vision, they just have diminished ability to perceive between two different colours. So dichromacy is when one type doesn't work at all, um, and there's also several forms of monochromacy, which is when there's no colour perception at all, and there's full and partial monochromacy. So is this a big deal, right? How much do we need to care about this? Well, turns out this is linked to both ethnicity as well as your gametes. So Europeans with XY chromosomes, most commonly identifying as men, um, are hit between about 6 to 9% of the population. Um, and that includes Pākehā New Zealanders. If you're a person of Asian descent with an XY chromosome, you're about 5 to 7%. Uh, if you are Māori Pacific Island, um, African, South American, you're about 1 to 3%. If you're an XX carrier, less than 1% everywhere, which is great. Um, but what this is, means is this is a pretty rare bird when it comes to accessibility problems, right? This disproportionately impacts people who identify as white men. You almost never see this in accessibility, but what it means is that given what our industry looks like, we should be pretty motivated to solve this one. It also probably means that somebody in your team, somebody you're friends with, someone you talk to is impacted by this. You have like free testers, it's really great. So how does this relate to data visualization? Well, turns out when we do data visualization, we rely a whole bunch on color to communicate meaning. So this is a chart from our old Figure NZ website. So the original is in the top left-hand corner, and this is how it looks in all of the eight forms of colour blindness. I'm just going to zoom in on one. This is how it looks for deuteranopes. So that's the one where it's 5% of XY Pākehā males affected. It's kind of crap. Now, this was before we realised we needed to design for this. This is how it looks for monochromacy. And this is partial monochromacy. Now, you might think partial monochromacy not that important, less than like 0.1% of the population impacted, no matter who you look at. Turns out that this kind of closely models what this would look like for an older adult with low contrast vision. Now, if you don't think that's important, it's already a big problem. It's going to get even bigger. We know we have an aging population, right? So if we want all these people to be able to read what we do, we need to take the time to create something they can read. So what do we do about that? So there are two basic principles at play here. So one of them is choose better colours, and the other one is to reduce your reliance on colour as the primary method of communication. Now colour is the hardest one, the biggest one, and also the one that people care the most about because they like how things look. Um, so let's talk about that one first. Now we obviously know there's more to colour than just accessibility. Right? So we want visually appealing colours, we want things that communicate information well, um, preferably in an unambiguous and unbiased way. I mean, some of you might want to do biased communication, it's not really my thing. Um, but the other thing we want is we want the colours to be able to be distinguished. So what that means is we want as much perceptual contrast between all of the colours as possible, regardless of your vision type. Okay, so perceptual contrast comes from variation in hue, which is the colour, and variation in lightness or brightness or luminosity. There's lots of names for the same thing. So the basic idea of this is that if your colour vision messes with your ability to perceive hue, then the change in brightness or luminosity is going to help you still be able to see what's going on. So when most people start to tackle this, they think about colours that are visually distinctive. So like the rainbow palette is the classic one people reach for, right? So this is what happens when you put this into colourblind form, right? You can see the areas that are going to be a little bit problematic already. Even if you have full colour vision, if you've got those at quite a distance away on a chart or on a visualisation, it's going to be kind of hard to tell those apart, right? So. What do you do about this, right? If what you think instinctively is going to be good is actually not good, how do you go about it? 
Now, you could mess about in Photoshop for like hours trying to figure this out, but nobody has time for that, let alone your design team. So luckily, we have the science of color spaces. Um, and they are here to help you, and when you understand a little bit about them, you can use your magical JavaScript powers and a little bit of math, and you can actually get answers to this. And your designer friends like me will really like you because you save us many, many, many hours of tears and pain. I spent three days on this the first time I had to tackle it. Now, to do this, you do need to know a little bit about color spaces. So we're going to talk quite nerdy for a bit here. Um, so what a color space is, and I'm going to read this because I'm going to get wrong, a color space is a mathematical representation of colors, right? So not all color spaces match perfectly to what you actually see. Not all color spaces measure the same part of the visual spectrum. So the color space most of us are used to is the RGB one. So we work with RGB values, we work with hex codes, right? Now those things are both representations of the RGB color space. So what this is is what's called a Cartesian coordinate based system, which is a fancy word to mean that you get three values and you go along each of the axes and then you find a spot, right? So the thing with RGB is it's awesome for computers because they use red and green and blue little lights to make up stuff. It's really, really not great for thinking about color perception, right? There is no way in the RGB space to model how lightness varies across that space in a mathematical way, unless you do a whole bunch of really complicated calculus, don't recommend it. So it's really hard to use this to mathematically calculate good palettes. Like, it's really hard, right? So take a guess if you look at this RGB value and think in your head what a 10% lighter value in terms of lightness would look like as an RGB code. Didn't go back, yeah? That to that. So much sense, not even a little bit of sense, right? It's so confusing. And if I want to pick colors that are then visually distinct on either side of this, get a whole spectrum, if I don't just want to keep the same hue, this is me basically the entire time when I'm trying to do it. So what else can we do about this, right? So browsers, as it turns out, support another color space. Awesome. Um, the other color space browsers support is HSL, which is hue, saturation, and lightness or luminosity. So HSL is what's called a cylindrical coordinate-based system. You can probably guess why it has that name. Um, so what you have in this one is saturation runs from zero, which is gray, out to 100, which is fully saturated on the outside. Lightness runs from black to white, again, zero to 100. Hue is allocated around a circle, so you've got a, a zero to 360 degrees for your hue allocation. This makes it really predictable. So right at 263 degrees, you know that you go around the circle and you're past where blue is, so you're somewhere between blue and red, you're getting a kind of purpley shade. Um, and same with saturation, you can predict this, same with lightness, right? So comparing this to RGB, right, if we want something that's 10% lighter, we change the lightness value, right? Now, as a side note, HSL is actually kind of cool to play with for other types of color work in the browser, so like image editing and stuff, it can be really, really, really neat for, because you know, overall, it's a predictable color space. We can apply math, and we can get a result we expect. Except for one thing. HSL doesn't take into account what's called perceptual brightness of hue. Right? So it turns out that not all hues are perceived equally. So these colors are all 100% saturation. They're all 50% lightness, so right in the middle of white and black. The only thing that varies is the hue. Turns out these are distributed exactly 60 degrees apart around our 360 degree circle. And this is what they're like in monochrome. So this means that it's not perceptually equal. And this was my face when I realized that. I was just like, crap. OK? So this means that we can't really use these from math to make colorblind-friendly palettes, because what's important with colorblind-friendly palettes is the ability to use maths to break down perceptually uniform spaces. So browsers don't support any other color spaces. Suboptimal. So some folks at a place called the CIE, which has a really, really long French name that I would say wrong, so the translation is the International Commission on Illumination, they decided to standardize color spaces. Which can be a little bit like, yeah, we know what happens when people make standards. But nonetheless, they came up with this thing called CIE LAB, 
which I'm just going to call LAB from now onwards because that's a bit of a mouthful and I don't want to keep saying C-Lab because that has other weird connotations if you watch cartoons. Um, so anyway, they came up with the LAB space, right? And this actually includes all colours that we can perceive. Cool. It includes the gamut, which is what's called the space. Um, that includes everything in RGB. It includes everything in CMYK. Basically, every other space we use is contained within the space, which means you can use it to like transfer from one colour space to another, right? So really, really useful. So it's a quick primer. I'm going to go nerdy again. Um, it's also a Cartesian plane system, so kind of like RGB in that regard, um, but it's based on something called opponent colour theory. So what opponent colour theory says is that a colour can't be both red and green at the same time, and it can't be both yellow or blue at the same time. So we assign yellow and blue to one axis and red and green to another axis, and same as HSL, lightness is your vertical one, right? So if we want to figure out a colour, we get a value for A, a value for B, and a lightness value, and then we go along the axis and out and then up or down, as the case may be. So this is actually a really, really weird looking space. Ooh, let's go back. Um, so it's not actually mapped nicely to a cone or a sphere or a cube or anything we're really good at instinctively understanding. It's like some distorted mass. Um, and so it's really hard to imagine how this is going to work, right? Because every one of the 101 levels of luminosity has a different space available. Right? I bet you never thought colour was actually this complicated. It turns out what we think instinctively, really, really confusing. Right? But LAB solves our perceptual brightness problem. Right? So these colours have the same saturation, right? or chroma, which as it's called in, in LAB. Um, they also have the same lightness or brightness. Um, and when you convert them into monochrome, they look identical. So don't use this palette for data visualization. It will be terrible. No one will be able to see what you do. Right? But LAB is awesome. Computers can use it to calculate the color palettes, no problem. Cool. But as a human being, it's really hard to use. It has terrible UX. Now, I'm a UX designer. I like good UX. So I don't like systems where I can't look at it and understand what's going on. Right? It's the Cartesian coordinate-based system problems again. So meet LCH. This is the like really friendly cousin of LAB. Don't worry, this is the last color space I'm going to talk about. Um, all this does is it takes LAB, converts it into a cylinder, so a shape we can kind of understand, um, but it keeps the perceptual uniformity. Right, so like in HSL, we can kind of understand what's going on in the space. Um, we have a, a radius that represents the chroma or saturation coming out from the centre. We convert the A and B into a hue angle. If you know basic trigonometry, you can probably see what's going on here, and lightness stays the same on the vertical axis. So this finally gives us a colour space with nice UX, mathematical predictability across the lightness spectrum. But as I said before, no direct browser support boo, hiss, etc. Please browser people, make life easier for us. So I want you to meet my good friend chroma.js. So there is a very wonderful dev that I would like to find and give a very big hug to, um, a guy called Gregor H. Um, and he took all of that complexity, bundled it up into one tiny JavaScript library, 12 kilobytes, minuscule. Right, so that does a whole bunch of color analysis, color conversion, um, all sorts of things. It's neat. But what we care about for the purposes of data visualization is it allows us to do what are called interpolations, which is a fancy word that basically just means spans, um, across both the LAB and LCH spaces. And at the end of it, you get an RGB or a hex value that you can use and put in your code. Cool. There is even a plugin for this for D3. Now, as Ray mentioned earlier, if you have not yet accepted our Lord and Saviour D3 into your life, please do so, right? The mistake most people make with data visits is like, oh, there are all of these libraries I can use that make it a little bit easier, and they're like slightly easier to learn than D3, but all of them will hit up against barriers pretty quickly if you want to do anything actually fun, right? D3 has a pretty steep learning curve. It is 100% worth it. Everyone in Dataviz basically says the same thing, and we're like, we're evangelists for this. But anyway, use D3. So what chroma.js enables you to do is, as I said, interpolate the color spaces. Um, and you can use either named values or hex values. So it'll give you a spectrum. You can then tell it to give you a number of colors across that spectrum. Cool. You can also 
put it into what LAB mode, and that'll give you one across the other color space. LAB mode interpolations are slightly better for contrast, slightly less saturated or vibrant colors. Depends on what your aesthetic is. Most people prefer LCH for that reason, but if you're into the slightly more muted look, then LAB, awesome. So what you're probably wondering right now is, why did I tell you all of that stuff about color blindness, color spaces, all of the really nerdy stuff, if all you need is like a few lines of JavaScript? So it turns out that unfortunately JavaScript can't solve everything, um, and it doesn't help you if you don't understand the basics. So you still need to know not to put in a start and an end color that are at the same level of brightness, or it's just going to give you a straight line across the space. You need to pick things that are at like opposite ends of the space. And you need to, I don't know, be a bit considerate and not put red and green, for example, particularly red and green of the same brightness, or you just get a row of things that look exactly the same. And if you're not into the palettes that you're getting out of it, you can also do this kind of cool thing where you get multi-color scales. Um, and that uses a technique called Bezier interpolations. Um, if you've heard the word Bezier before, it's again a fancy term that just means we create a smooth curve. Um, and it also has lightness correction to make sure that that perceptual uniformity stays across the curve that you do through that color space. So you can use this to force it to go through different parts of the color space if the pretty colors aren't quite what you're after. Um, Bezier interpolations do only run in the LAB space, so they are going to be a little bit less pretty, but overall, pretty good solution. So, a word of warning. Chroma scales, which is what these are, they will give you palettes that are overall visually appealing, particularly if you understand basic color theory, especially if you go out and look in nature and use it to seed what you're doing, like, you know, sunsets are pretty and flowers are pretty and those types of things. Um, our palettes at Figure and Z are based on a Kia tale. Um, things that occur in nature are more likely to be visually appealing when you put them on a website too. But they are a variation in lightness scale. Right? So they look at variation on one axis, you give it a seed color, and that forces it to go one of the other ways as well. What this means is that it doesn't give you maximum variation across both hue and lightness, right? which is the optimal principle, but gives you really ugly stuff, just as a word of warning. Right? So if you are building visualizations and you need a range of more than five colors, you will po quite possibly start to run into problems of perceptual difference. So, first thing, try and simplify what you're communicating. If you have more than five lines on a chart, you maybe need to relook at the data or you need to think about a different way of displaying it. Um, if you are really, really stuck and you absolutely need like 15 lines on a chart, which is a thing, um, then Color Brewer is your friend, right? So Color Brewer is a series of palettes that are designed by this wonderful lady called Cynthia Brewer who did so much research into this um, they're specifically designed for use in chloroplith maps, but they also work really well for other types of data visualization. Okay? So you can see that there is an option there on the left-hand side that says colorblind safe. You can select that. It's not perfect, but it's better than just kind of randomly guessing. Um, and there is a part of the chroma.js library that enables you to grab these palettes, pull them into what you're doing. Right? Super easy. I'm not going to get into it here because not enough time, but um, there are three different types of data, sequential, diverging, qualitative. If you're doing data visualization, go and read about them. They do impact what palettes you're using for maps, particularly a little bit for charts, but less so. So this is what my work ended up with from our Keatale palette. Here's what it looks like in all the different forms for colorblind users. Awesome. People can actually read it. Great result. So if we've got color nailed, what else do we have? So line charts are the hardest. These are all really quick, don't worry. Um, be smart about your legend labels, right? If possible, put your legend labels by the lines. Good for everyone, reduces cognitive load. Okay, you don't have to then be like, legend, maps, legend, map, right? Makes it a little bit easier so that you don't have to flip between the two. Um, otherwise, if you need to have a legend that's separate, make sure that your legend order at whatever end it is of your chart matches the order of the lines. Okay, so again, you're just reducing the reliance on just having color. You use either order or use position on the chart. You can also use interactivity to help. This is from the New Zealand Herald Insights. Um, they use interactivity to show uh, which you know, line is being used and show a value for that line. Not great for keyboard accessibility, so just bear that in mind. Um, also isn't great if people are going to want to compare multiple lines at the same time because their cognitive load increases as they need to retain the information from the label. But works for some types of things. 
Um, if you don't have too many lines, you can use line styles, so like dotted and dashed lines of different weights. This is from D3. Um, it's built in automatically, the code snippet. Um, don't use this if you have a lot of variability in your lines because it hides the meaning. Um, but really great if you've got like two or three lines that are just general trends on a chart. Um, this means that the line style as well as the color communicates that meaning. Um, same applies for data points. Again, if you don't have a whole bunch of data points and if you're just doing trend lines, you can use like a dot and a triangle and a square or a star or whatever. Right? You can use other things as well to communicate that meaning. But perhaps most importantly, don't leave this up to chance. You'll be like we did in our first version of a site where you are someone who builds charts that half the people can't see. Well, not half the people, like one in 20 people can't see. All right, so test it. Find a friend, see if any of your colleagues, any of the white dudes you know in tech can help you out. There are a number of apps you can use to test it. So I use an app called SimDaltonism. There is a Spectrum Chrome plugin that you can test this in the browser. Um, all of these are free to download, really, really easy to use. Um, some Daltonism, you literally have keyboard shortcuts to flick through them all. You can test every palette in less than 30 seconds. Um, a lot of colorblind users will also use Chrome's high contrast plugin, right? Um, so test your visualization with that enabled. What that does is invert every color palette on your site. So you probably want to do this even if you don't care about um, data visualization because it helps you to understand how some people are going to interact with what you build. So those are your two basic principles, right? Choose better colors, don't rely on color alone. Okay, so the main thing I want you to take away, right, is that data visualization is actually really awesome for helping to communicate information. And that once you understand the principles, it's not that hard to include everyone in what you build. So please try and do it, don't be slack, right? But try it out, have fun with it. I'd like to hear about what you do if you do. Um, this is obviously a nerdy subject for me. Um, and that's everything I've got for you, thank you. I don't think we have time for questions. Or do we? Great, thank you very much. Um, I found that um, fascinating. Uh, uh, one more round of applause for Nat.